Welcome to my video on the grift. I mean, 2000. Yeah, the year 2000s. The gift review and thoughts. Seriously, I'm gonna try to keep to a minimum jokes about how BS the the this this the um. Let's see. She doesn't like it when you call it fortune telling. Psychic psychics. Are. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. I do I love the movie despite the the psychic thing. Welcome to my chat. Welcome to my channel where apparently every time I review a movie, it has to be directed by someone I vlogged about at least once before and its title is the word the followed by a noun. The Nightingale, The Abyss, now The Gift. Seriously though, I did not plan to do three of these in a row. It just happened to work out that way. Next week should break the title trend at least. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that it's not, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And yeah, so this movie is rated R and ultimately it uses the rating well so yeah there is some strong language and yeah I might also swear in this video though I will not be repeating the slurs used by some characters and I don't think the movie is saying that it's okay to hate those minorities now That brings us to... So, so yes, I believe this is only my second viewing. I watched this movie back in the year 2004. And, yeah, I just, I only got access to it again recently. Otherwise, I probably would have watched it in the meantime. So yes, the yeah, uh, the plot IMDb does a good job here. So I'm just going to quote directly: A fortune teller with extrasensory perception is asked to help find a young woman who has mysteriously disappeared. And let's see. so yeah, um, before I start talking details about the technical aspects, I would say people are very talented. There's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display and let's get into the writing so this was written by the writing duo of Billy Bob Thornton and Tom Epperson and Billy Bob of course very well known for his acting and this is the yeah they've, they've written other things together Thornton is an amazing actor. This is the only thing I've watched that he wrote. It is not the first script of theirs, and he also, Billy Bob, directed Sling Blade and Jane's Man Jane Mansfield's Car, both of which they wrote together. And let's see, yeah, in, in total, there's like 10 different things that the yeah and you know sling blade was very well received so yeah the that's right yeah he wrote directed and starred in that so while i personally can't compare to the other stuff they've written it seems like they they do a good job of of writing things together and the the writing here is quite good. It's not the best I've ever seen, but it's it's good. Now, it's, yeah. So so this movie claims that Kate Blanchett's Kate Blanchett is a medium. This is very offensive, not only because psychics in real life are scammers who prey on the vulnerable, but more so because Kate Blanchett is in no way medium. She is way above par. 
now the yeah so the the screenplay does a good job of like the the various characters are very distinct from each other and there's a very clear there's some very clear th clear themes in it that are very consistent they're not just like mentioned once and then nothing else is really you know they actually you know yeah they're they're brought up and they're expanded upon and there's you know yeah so you know one of one of the major themes is misogyny and patriarchy we we very much see how women are disadvantaged in this society you know the the Annie has a difficult time getting by it's not legal for her to be t accepting money for the the psychic readings that she does but the the you know she she has to get by somehow she basically she accepts donations which is technically legal you know you can accept donations for basically anything that doesn't mean that you're charging money for something that might be illegal and the the you know a lot of the men don't believe women when they you know yeah they 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 don't believe women they don't take seriously when something bad happens to women a, a lot of the time now i i will say there's a one character like not long after we meet him he has a line where he basically he puts down jewish people and african americans using slurs and well a, a slur he, do, he doesn't use a slur for jewish people but he does for, for black people and you know, I've I've seen others say that's kind of lazy writing. It you know, it's a it's a very easy way to tell the audience this is a bad guy. You know, that w without really and and yeah, I I it's it's I don't really have a a good counter counter argument. I'm gonna have to agree with them on that especially because we don't really see like he he clearly is a misogynist but there's not a lot of stuff where he's like really hateful to war where you know it's it's yeah it's it's uh, I don't know if I want to say if it's the only time but it's one of the only times that he expresses racism you know most of the time it's misogyny and basically, like, when writing it, they were probably like, what if people don't think that it's bad enough that he's a misogynist, we better make him a really vicious racist as well, even though it doesn't actually change anything. Like, if you took out the line, there wouldn't be anything else in the movie that would be done a disservice to that. And, you know, it's... I realize not everybody agrees with that, but there is a... a one one bit of writing advice is take out everything that isn't strictly necessary everything should add up to something so that's the kind of thing that if you were really you know there's the, the term kill your darlings if you wanted to go all the way you would take that out and it's clear that it is just there to to you know big auga you know flashing lights signal to the audience this is a bad guy when the misogyny speaks for itself but yeah now the movie handles plot twists fairly well um let's see some people said that they did figure out some of the major plot twists i don't know i you know i remembered them which i suppose is actually a you know a point in favor of it remembering something that you know in a, in a movie that I haven't watched in almost 20 years the first time I watched it it really like the the plot twist you know I I didn't see that stuff coming at all so 
yeah, I, yeah, it does a good job. Now that that brings us to direction. So this was directed by Sam Raimi, and yeah, other than this movie, I will let you know where this ranks at the end of the review itself. Ranked worst to best, all of the Sam Raimi movies that I have watched: Spider-Man Three, Oz, Dragman Hell, The Quick and the Dead, and the rest of ones I all love: Spider-Man One, Spider-Man Two, Evil Dead One. Evil Dead 2, Doctor Strange, Evil Dead 3, or Army of Darkness, If You're Nasty, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1. And, right, I'm going to briefly quote from my old, so this is my review from 2004. There are a lot of very psychologically horrifying sequences. The plot is very interesting. Most of the film keeps your interest going well. The atmosphere of the film is fantastic. The horror scenes were all well made. I jumped several points throughout the scenes. The psychological terror was almost unbearable. Every single sequence involving psychological terror is very disturbing. Whoever did the editing for this film obviously knows a great deal about how to affect the subconscious. And the film's supernatural side is very well handled and seems quite believable. Yeah, the the you know it is not as it's it's part drama and part psychological horror it's more psychological horror than than like traditional horror you know but it yeah it is very very effective psychological horror some people will you know if if this is something if you watch this thinking of Sam Raimi as the evil dead guy this is not up to the you know it it doesn't go anywhere near that far and the the horror you know yeah a lot of the horror in the evil dead is body horror and the threat of like bodily harm and that kind of thing and that's not there's not very much at all of that in this it's especially yeah there's there's not a lot of that in in this and I, I was going to expand on it, but I think that's arguably a spoiler, so I'm going to not in the review itself. And the, you know, it's it's more of a, a drama than, you know, the, the Evil Dead movie is not really drama at all. And, you know, this is not as tense and suspenseful and consistently so as a simple plan which I rewatched for comparison. You know, I I watch that movie ever so often, it, regardless. But yeah, I I watched it. Let's say not not yesterday, but the day before yesterday. And that one, you know, there is a very. You know, in in part, it comes down to the screenplay. That movie is very very, f like laser focused. Everything is about this thing of the money that this small group of people find and how the 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 fear of losing that money affects them where this movie an argument could definitely be made that it the the focus is the the psychic power and then this mystery but or or perhaps more accurately Actually, yes, the psychic power is the mystery, and then this thing of the the various problems that this small town deals with, you know, and these are not bad things to focus on, but the movie isn't as focused as a simple plan, and thus not quite as effective. Now... I've got some critic quotes. Stylistically, viewers will likely recognize the patented Raimi vision. Chaotic, frightening images blinking rapidly over the widening eyes of the protagonist. Not too bad in a gothic whodunit kind of way. Once the story chooses its path, a glance downward reveals the ruts worn by the many plot vehicles that have traveled this road before. This is one of the best films about the supernatural that has come out in recent years, along with The Others and The Sixth Sense. 
brimming with gentility, quiet sadness, and weary perseverance. Blanchett's mesmerizing Annie brings to mind the sturdy, often lonely women Sissy Spacek created in movies like Raggedy Man and Marie. Thoughtful and gripping without wallowing in dramatics, it marks another high point in Sam Raimi's strange but increasingly accomplished film career. And one person said, bored by a competent but unoriginal supernatural mystery. I, I never, I wouldn't call the movie boring, but it definitely is unoriginal. The whodunit had many contrivances, and they all sap strengths from films or rather, already rather weak mystery stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's definitely some truth to that. I wouldn't go quite that far, but yeah. It's a good story with an unexpected and even almost shocking plot twist and a whole film of very, very good performances, a richly textured psychological occult tale of desolation, troubled lives in backwoods Georgia, Sam Raimi's directorial flair and Chris Young's fiddle-flecked score aren't enough to prop up the supernatural confederate corpse that comes up short in script and satisfaction, an overwrought corn poem, southern gothic, gothic twilight zone padded to feature length. Yes, I... I think this would have been a better Twilight Zone episode. I don't think there's quite enough material to support feature length. When when critic says it just feels like no one really even tried on this one, which I would 100% disagree with. I feel like everyone's trying. I I agree that it doesn't come together. It it the 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 whole is less than the sum of its parts, but. I would definitely say, like, I would, I would really love to know what this person thinks. Like, what did they spot that felt to them as indications that someone wasn't trying? I, I, yeah, like, I could, I could one hundred percent understand if some of the actors felt like, what am I doing here? Why am I, you know, doing this really uninspired material? You know, the, the, um, there's, um, let's see, yeah, Hilary Swank, uh, you know, yeah, Hil Hilary Swank had just won an Oscar for playing a transgender teenager in Boys Don't Cry, and, I mean, overall, she does a pretty good job here. But I could understand if she like took one look at the script and was like, "That's it. That's all that you're gonna give me. That that's all there is to my character." You know the, and it really does. It's not a role that requires someone of her immense talent. Like I've, I've done a video on Boys Don't Cry. I that that movie is amazing, and she is amazing in it. Like that's if she wasn't convincing the movie would not work. You know, and it's, it's a movie with a lot of really excellent performances. You know, in addition to her, there's the... the I will find it momentarily. There's Chloe Sevigny and Peter Sarsgaard also do phenomenal work in it. You know, it's basically like every every major character is is played really well. Alicia Gorenson, Brendan Sexton the Third, um, Jeanette Arnett, Jeanetta Arnett, and Alison Fallon. Everyone does a really solid job, but yeah. Let's see. One person says barely 50% of the chilling suspense is actually chilling. See, I would say it's 100%. Ribisi is fantastic, proof that a talented cast and crew is sometimes enough to turn second-rate material into first-rate entertainment. An anemic throwaway that starts strong but fades fast due to a main plotline that offers few surprises and a secondary story that is handled ineptly. There are a few things better than watching a director in complete control. Raimi and his cast and crew deserve a praise for what they did give us, but it isn't quite enough. A series of creepy images that never give you a reason to care whether the characters survive them or not. I wouldn't... I I would definitely say there are, ma there are major characters in this that I really sympathized with. Let's see... 
there's really just one reason to see the Southern Freak Show, that is St. Raimi's The Gift, and fortunately it's the best reason, and fortunately, not unfortunately, to watch The Star of the Peace, a glorious textbook example of a gifted filmmaker's ability to transform a familiar genre and thrillingly to confound our expectations in the process. Actually, that... I don't think I wrote... I'll just make sure real quick... there and let's see the the gift looks like an attempt to create a classier version of the kind of horror movie that established Remy's reputation nearly two decades ago it's like a play that's been opened up for the screen expanded and filmed on real locations but retaining all of the carefully worded stage dialogue it never sounds real and I suppose that's the point Remy and Blanchett are formid formidable tag team, and when they're rolling, the gift can be bone-chillingly good. Ramian cinematographer Jamie, Jamie Anderson do a fine job setting the mood for peace, capturing the decrepit-looking southern buildings in a way that suggests menace may be lurking around the corner. Never presses as much with its supernatural aspects, which seem to be in the script mostly as a way to get across some otherwise impossible plot holes. Again, I would love to know what this person thought were plot holes. Just, yeah. Now, I mean, I'll grant that there's awkward writing here, but I don't, I wouldn't really say any of it is solved by the psychic abilities. Like, there's a part where, you know, there's a, there's a witness that, like, it's, it's very convenient that this person managed to see exactly what they did nothing more nothing less you know that was would would be but that didn't have anything to do with the psychic anyway and old-fashioned well-made suspense thrill simply works because of those combined efforts from the cast and crew the biggest surprise is Reeves. As the violent racist Donnie, he is white trash personified, a seething dynamo of scraggly whiskers and sneering brutality. This is the best the actor's ever been. Very true. And it's actually, it's kind of funny because, like, you know, when, when they made this, they felt, like, okay, if, we, if he's got, like, a big beard, he's going to look really, you know, we're, we're going to think of him as, like, really unpleasant and such. But it's actually, it's very, very similar to his beard as, like, John Wick, where he's, like, the hero, or anti-hero, but, you know. So, so that's a, yeah. Now, uneven and conventional. Raimi and Thornton have only enough material this time to sustain half a movie. Raimi and Blanchett can't turn grits into polenta, but they try. At its best, the gift, the gift evokes some of the creepy chills of To Kill a Mockingbird, and at its heart, there's Blanchett, an actress whose instincts are unerring and dead on. And... Raimi's skillful direction, the way he positions the camera, and his brilliant pacing keep things jumping almost until the final frame. One person said that the movie eventually starts to play as an unintended parody of overblown hokum. And a solidly crafted, suspensefully written, powerfully acted little juggernaut. Even if you figure out where the gift is headed, the actors keep you watching closely. The movie is ingenious in its plotting colorful and characters taught in its direction, fortunate in possessing Kate Blanchett. Originality is clearly not a strong point with this script. One critic says, It's not wise to build a story around a psychic. If you don't believe in this stuff, the story simply will not work ever, anyhow, anyway, anytime, any place. Unless you're literally an atheist, it really doesn't make sense to make that case. I'm an atheist. I watch tons of movies made by and for believers. For most of them, I'm supposed to pretend that theism makes any sort of sense now that we have science and know better. Like, there's some chance, I guess, that that person is an atheist, but just, I really, really hate when, when people who do believe in something that you can't, 
you know, any any kind of supernatural anything, whether it's psychics or religion or whatever, who who say, ah, I don't know, I mean, that doesn't really make sense. Oh, come on, none of it makes sense. I don't think that we should... I agree with criticizing it, but let's not criticize it from such a... Um, you know, it, you, you don't have any grand, ground to stand on if you believe in anything supernatural to be criticizing something f supernatural for not being believable. It's fine to say about other things. Criticize it. Like, the problem with psychics isn't that they make for bad stories. The problem is that they take advantage of vulnerable people who just want, you know, to feel a connection with someone they lost just one more time, and then you have these scam artists taking their money and just making stuff up. It just, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Moderately engrossing, but taxingly teased. Pulp. We're back to the credit quotes. And uh, let's see, some improbable situations, an ultimately predictable outcome, dependence on at least two suspense movie cliches, untimely thunder in an overflowing bathtub, rather pedestrian who done it. And let's see. Unlike what lies beneath, whose slick style revived the derivative tale, the gift is a leaden narrative unrelieved by the heavy application of theatrics or atmospherics. Yeah. I, I don't I haven't watched uh, What Lies Beneath, but that is definitely what what that quote said about this movie is true. A deliciously creepy little picture that has director Sam Raimi effectively incorporating supernatural shocks and making terrific use of a cast led by Kate Blanchett. While this movie has none of the power of a simple plan, he knows how to get his audience on the edge of its collective seat. Right, the a simple plan came out, I think, right before this one. If, I, I'm not sure they he released any movies in between these two, so comparisons are of course gonna happen and that was a movie where he got to direct a really amazing script <clears throat> you know and and like a simple plan this one it doesn't feel like Sam Raimi is trying to turn something that very much is not the Evil Dead into the Evil Dead you know it it's wild that, like, if you asked me 20 years ago, or, or I guess, oh, have to go, go, back, go back further, but, yeah, like, I would never have believed that the guy who did the first three Evil Dead movies could actually do something that is this distinctly, like, some this, and especially a simple plan, you know? But yeah, let's see. And and you know, Dark Man. It's it's a different direction than The Evil Dead, but it is very, like it's operatic. You know, it is it is like a comic book come to life, like the the Evil Dead movies. You know, so yeah. And and the fact that he's able to do something, as masterfully subtle as a simple plan really proves that there's much more to him than just yeah and it's also you know when he made the evil dead he was like in college you know he was he was perhaps not the most mature person not you know some people are very mature in college but you know he was a young man he was he was uh, yeah i know i know i'm too young to be using to be saying he was young now, let's see, you know, I mean, I remember my 20s. I've also had ideas that were pretty out there. Now, let's see, while the film overall is more concerned with mounting menace than edge of your seat shots, shocks, it delivers a couple of stunners. Characters lean too heavily toward the southern grotesque and the direction the plot is heading is more predictable than it should be. Wasn't really scary at all. The director fills it with every scary movie camera trick in the book, but it's the story that doesn't work. 
after establishing himself as a giant of the movie making as a contact port school with orgies of stylistic excess, Dark Man, the Evil Dead series, Sam Raimi proved himself just as capable of subtle character oriented storytelling with 1998's superb A Simple Plan. A neo noir grounded in the bleak conditions of its setting, that film excelled as both a human drama and riven, riveting thriller. Raimi pulls off the same feat with The Gift in a performance. Wow, I copied in a lot of what this guy said. Um. Okay, I think I'm just gonna skim right real quick. There are a couple of other things that let's see. Yeah, Kate Blanchett serves. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, her character serves as a paragon of virtue and honesty in a southern small town desperately in need of both. And let's see. As in A Simple Plan, Raimi captures the desperation and sadness of life among the working poor through countless telling details. Anachronistic hairstyles, Kmart ensembles, homes that barely qualify as functional without resorting to the condescension and ridicule that typify most Hollywood depictions of working class life. Raimi is particularly perceptive about gender roles, showing the ways the town's institutionalized sexism not only circumscribes what women can and can't do, but also stacks the deck against Blanchette, even before her gift places her... Let's see. The screenplay throws in too many red herrings. But, but yeah, the... the um, it's, it's very true. There's a lot of really great subtle details. And... With an unbelievable cast like this, in a story set in stereotypes rich South, you'd expect each actor to go for that over-the-top ache and try to outact the others, but every actor keeps his or her eye on the ball in the solid thriller from writers. With about Thornton and Tom Epperson, every actor has a moment to shine, but the real revelation here is Keanu Reeves as a bearded abuse of Redneck. Redneck. His performance makes you forget the villain's head surfer dude or the buff speed action hero. He's bluntly evil. He makes his character's violent streaks seem so natural and ingrained, never for a moment do you doubt. Like, try to watch his performance in this and then watch one of those wonderful interviews where he's just the nicest guy you know like he said some someone asked him what do you think would happen if John Wick you know versus Ethan Hunt you know you and Tom Cruise you know currently two of the biggest action movie franchises you know what do you think and and you know, obviously, like, the setup is for him to say, oh, you know, I'm gonna kick his ass, or, you know, it would be a real, you know, it would be something spectacular. But he just calmly says, you know, I think it would be nice if they, if they sat down and talked and had a conversation. And it's just, like, how is this guy, like, so nice in real life, and he plays these violent, dangerous people, like, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, he's such a great person. And, you know, perhaps not a great actor, but when he, when it works, it really works. When, you know, when he got his performance, when his performance works, it really works. And let's see, if you like a good thriller and want to see some actors at the top of their game, this gift is for you. People who hated Reeves' accent and Devil's Advocate watch this as he gets for redemption. Might even say his best expressive work. Uh, director Sam Raimi is an expert in genre twisting. Back when he was making The Evil Dead, he so overloaded his gore epic that it eventually became funny. With Gift, he takes on a genre even more arcane, the British whodunit, than he does some weird shit with it. First, he transports the whole shebang to the deep south to remove all traces of afternoon tea or warm beer. Then he gives us Kate Blanchett as clairvoyant detective. And then as a masterstroke, he takes a raft of famous faces, cast most of them against type. The normally pale and interesting Keanu Reeves as a redneck, Hilary Swank. Okay, yeah, Greg Kinnear, best known in 2000 for playing a gay role in As Good As It Gets. Let's see... And let's 
the otherwise it's who done it business as usual red herrings blind avenues bumbling policemen epiphanies at midnight and of course a completely now why didn't I see that ending enjoyable as hot butter toast and um, then there's this one user review who said just watch this for the first time maybe it was great in quotes why did he put it in quote anyway 30 years ago but it certainly isn't now exclamation point this review is from 2021 I guess it's possible that this person just can't count can't tell the difference between 20 years and 30 years but I like to imagine that it's actually a time traveler and something horrible would have happened before the year 2031 that has now been thwarted by them traveling to 2021 reviewing a movie that was at the time 20 years old and kind of forgotten about so yes I took some notes while watching a simple plan so both movies are yeah set in a small town in the south but in a simple plan the people largely like the protagonist respect him including the sheriff here yeah some do but there's definitely others that absolutely do not and while Hank admits at the the start he didn't really think about it but he did have a pretty good life before the events of the simple plan that is then of course threatened by the events of that movie that definitely isn't the case for Annie and this obviously creates pressures here that are not in in that and I'm again I'm not saying that this is a better movie but just yeah those are some differences you know Sam Raimi brought back a third of the supporting cast from a simple plan and he would go on to bring back a third of the new supporting cast from this for Spider-Man so that's and and these were like you know pretty much three movies in a row for for him so that's yeah I mean other other than that he actually works with a lot of different people and yeah so so Kate Blanchett you know in incredibly talented actress and she makes a lot of decisions in her performance and they're spot on there's there's a part in this movie where like one of her clients is kind of freaking out and she represses her anxiety and concern while trying to calm down this client and and when the client is like crying and, and looking down you can see that that like a lot of it comes out in her face and she's struggling to keep her voice from showing it because she understands that what this person needs right now is for her to be completely calm but she's also herself you know she's she has shit to deal with so yeah and right uh some people some of them southern themselves say that it's awful that this movie makes southern people look bad ignoring the fact that there are multiple positive depictions of southern characters whereas many misogynistic movies will make it appear that every woman is awful and when you bring this up to these same people or you know woman you know pe person of color you know minorities in general and when you bring this up to these same people, they'll say, ah, I need to stop taking things so seriously. You shouldn't care. Why does it matter? Or they'll try to make the case why that doesn't matter, even though the South is, like, significantly less hated, less discriminated against. But they have a victim complex because that's what Christianity teaches. One of the things that Christianity teaches. And to be fair, not everything Christianity teaches is bad. I just wish that more of the good things were actually, you know, they would actually practice them, not just preach them. Now, let's see, but, but right, yeah, you know, these same people will say that, you know, will act as though the minorities aren't way more discriminated against than Southerners. Now, uh, yeah, so, so Kate Blanchett plays Annie, and her husband has been dead for a year when the, the movie starts. Grieving is one of those universal yet taboo things. We will do it at least once in our lives, if not for people and for pets. So it's extremely important to do it well in media. And yeah, this movie does a, a pretty good job. Not, not the best I've seen, but, you know, the, the basically, on multiple occasions, she kind of doesn't completely face it head on like it's clear that she's still upset about it but like you know she doesn't really talk with 
her eldest son Ben about it, even though he wants to to talk about. It. And it's important, you know, when when people, it's it's important to to uh, when when you lose someone close to you. It doesn't only affect you personally, individually, it affects everyone close to that person. Not, not necessarily in the same way, but any that want to talk about it, any that want to, to try to remember the, the person they lost and, you know, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a fear that you'll forget the, the person and it's extremely important to to not you know there's actually at, at one point someone suggests to her maybe maybe he should talk to a therapist and she shoots that down and the the yeah you know she says she, he can talk to me you know and yeah now let's see that brings us so yeah the the opening of the movie does a really good job like it's intensely creepy the the start of of the movie and yeah really does a good job setting up the rest and right i'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but the ending fits with what came before i think the ending is is Good. I. It's, I mean, the first time I watched it, I absolutely loved the ending. I think it is just, you know, I remember it, and the second, it's it's not quite as, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. For for some reason, it didn't completely hit me the way. And and to be clear, like a simple plan, I also remembered exactly what happened, and that hit me harder. I th I think, yeah. A simple plan survives repeat viewings and already knowing the ending from from repeat viewings better than this, in my opinion. Some critics or some reviewers love it, some hate it, and I think an argument could be made that there's some convenient writing that, yeah, and. That brings us to the characters, other than what I've already said about them. So, yeah, Kate Blanchett as Annabelle Annie Wilson, and the movie points out how some people in America really struggle with poverty. You know, she's on food stamps, taking care of three kids, and she can't be legally paid for the psychic stuff, so takes donations, when obviously the government could easily afford to make sure that she and her kids were taken care of. Just trim off the grotesquely bloated military budget, maybe raise taxes on rich people a smidgen. Honestly, if you don't tell them, they won't even notice. Poor people would notice. They can't afford it. Giovanni Ribisi plays Buddy Cole and... You know, some some people say that he's overacting, but the it's definitely you know there's a it's a the performance goes to a high intensity, and and there are definitely points where it doesn't completely feel like. You know, it, it feels a little Oscar baby. And yeah, Keanu Reeves is Donnie Barksdale. Movies like this and Street Kings, he proves that he is both willing to and capable of portraying unstable, violent people using the physicality that leads to him being so compelling in action films to make him genuinely intimidating. Keep in mind, this movie was filmed and released after the first Matrix movie. A lot of actors would have coasted off that kind of thing. I mean, at the time, most viewers wished they were Neo, but instead, he takes a role like this. And, you know, I'm not going to claim that he's the best actor in the world, but I think that really, you know, demands respect. Like, honestly... I, uh, to be fair, I don't know if they were... Was there a contract? Did they even know they were going to make more than one Matrix movie? But, you know, you could see how, like, some studio people might have been like... You know, might watch this movie and be like, we can't let him come back to the Matrix movies. People are going to 
run screaming away from the theater. Let's see. You know, there's there's nothing of Neo in this. So, and, and you know, yeah, no trace of, you know, some of, some of the goofier characters he's played and such. And let's see. I don't, there's not a lot I can say about Katie Holmes' character, Jessica King, without spoiling anything. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll get into details about her in the, the um, thoughts section, in the second thoughts section. There we go. So, um, let's see. Yeah, Greg Kinnear is great as Wayne Collins. I already mentioned Hilary Swain's well, Valerie Barksdale. Michael Jeter as Gerald Weems. Kim Dickens as Linda. Gary Cole as David Duncan. So, so yeah, you know, the, the, um, that's it, yeah. Uh, Gary Cole and Chelsea Ross, you know, who are in this, were also in A Simple Plan, and the, you know, this has Rosemary Harris and J.K. Simmons, who are in the Spider-Man movies, so, yeah. And Rosemary Harris's character, right? She doesn't even have a, a name. It's just, she is Annie's grandmother. And J.K. Simmons plays Sheriff Pearl Johnson. And that's another. You know, I don't. Nobody. Nobody needs me to tell them that J.K. Simmons is intensely talented. But like, in this, he is nothing like the the J. Jonah Jameson. You know, from the. I feel like, okay, I've said so many positive things about acting. I suppose a counterpoint would be that I don't know why Sam Raimi keeps casting, or I guess he eventually stopped, but for a while kept casting the... I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but I'll have it momentarily because he is in Spider-Man... Uh, James Franco. He cast James Franco in multiple Spider-Man movies. He cast him in Oz the Great and Powerful. Like, I don't know what he sees in him. I really don't. I, I, yeah. But, you know, so, so I'm not saying that every single actor in a Sam Raimi movie, in every single Sam Raimi movie is great. And, right, from my overview, the characters are interesting, well-developed, the acting is all great, every single actor does a very good job. And... Let's see. Now, the... Right, already, try, already talked some about the dialogue. That brings us to the cinematography. Now, the movie's cinematographer was Jamie Anderson, and he has 33 credits as cinematographer, most recently in 2020, so he is still working. And let's see, so yeah, he's done some TV but this is not the only movie he's done and yeah so other than this he was DP on Gross Point Blank which I remember as being well shot but I haven't watched that movie in like 20 years Small Soldiers which, which is well shot and you know there's an extra challenge there because they're working much of the work is with puppets but they still they're still shot in cinematic ways. He shot an episode of ER. He shot Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, which definitely has moments of great cinematography. And Crossing Jordan. So so yeah. He does a really great job. The the you know there are very much some of some of the angles that we know from 
the the kind of the tilted camera angle that is very very familiar for fans of Sam Raimi you know yeah it's used very well here you know the the it's the kind of thing where like you know Sam Raimi had to to rein in some of his more you know wild you know he he couldn't go hog wild the way he does on the Evil Dead movies, it wouldn't fit the the style the the rest of the movie is, is going for. So the but they still did use these same some yeah they they managed to find ways to work in you know for example in Psychic Visions and yeah they're they're made very very creepy and disturbing to to watch and. Uh, that brings us to the editing. This was edited by Arthur Coburn and Bob Morawski. And Arthur edited 28 total. And last edited in 2009. Bob edited 40, including Doctor Strange the Multiverse of Madness. And he has one coming up. Right, the World War Three. That is also that Sam Raimi is so so yeah they're still working together and yeah Arthur Coburn after this edited the first Spider Man so and before it he edited a simple plan so yeah they had a good working relationship and you can you can tell like he understands how to make the Sam Raimi style work for this kind of thing and Bob Morawski also edited more yeah he dragged me to hell spider-man 3 spider-man 2 spider-man 1 and yeah so so go the the shot to shot momentary editing is really really great and there's a couple of times, there's, there's this one part where Donnie is very physically abusive and they actually choose to, you know, this was, this was a decision by both the DP and the, the, actually wasn't more of a DP sh decision than editing. Anyway, they decide to shoot in like this handheld and there's almost no cuts in the scene so it really places you it puts you right there there's a very visceral sort of sense you know it feels like it's going on right in front of you in a way that sometimes editing can take away from and yeah um they also like i'm not sure there's any scene that should just completely be taken out though definitely some of them are there to, <clears throat> to to stretch it out a little though it doesn't I, I would say it's more when you think back you you realize that there's some very excellent use of reaction shots um, when there's multiple people in you know there when there's stuff being revealed and you'll see some of the people you know, um, is that a spoiler? There's just the, the, there's a there's a point where someone spoke to the authorities, spoke to lawyers and such, and you know stuff is coming out now, and the person who said these things you know some someone will look at them and feel like betrayed or you know or or you know other times there's a sense of I'm really glad you said that that was exactly the right thing to do in that so you know and and yeah very very effective and right so that brings us to the 
the budget was 10 million and the box office was 44.6 and yeah it doesn't feel cheap it they they put the money to good use you know there's a certain expectation for hollywood movies that they have to look reasonably expensive if you're going to get regular americans to watch and yeah i can completely understand why it made you know that's a that's a good percentage earning you know and yeah this is the kind of movie that you might watch more than once and you might tell your friends you got to see this movie now that brings us to yeah it it was indeed filmed in georgia various different places around georgia and they make really good use of the locations like you know the, you watch this and you think back and it's like how did how was it that there was like a chunk of of filmmaking history where like a lot of movies were actually shot on sets you know the, this movie really shows why it's good to use locations there's this massive lake and these just the the trees and the fog and just it it incredibly creepy you know and yeah i'm i'm really really glad that they appreciated you know you probably don't have to ask Sam Raimi twice if he would like to film something creepy in a forest you know nature environment and right the music is very very effective some people felt that it goes a little overboard and I can understand why I thought it was fantastic throughout but yeah it was handled by Christopher Young who was born April 28th of a year and he is still composing he yeah, he has 132 credits as composer. And yeah, he's done a bunch other horror, including very recent horror. And yeah, um, he worked with Sam Raimi on Drag Me to Hell as well. And Spider Man 3. So yeah, you know, again, a, a good working relationship, and it, you know, bringing a, a composer back, that means that you thought they did a good job, you know, that you, you were satisfied with what they delivered, and yeah, so that brings us to so yeah the pacing definitely I wouldn't call it boring but there definitely are parts of the movie where it is somewhat slow it's not really necessarily in much of a hurry and yeah so the movie is in length an hour and 51 minutes and yeah if you watch the first 30 or 40 minutes if if after that you don't really care what happens next then you may want to stop watching if if you're watching it by yourself so the best element is tied between the acting especially that of Kate Blanchett and the supernatural horror if you you know if you if you have been blessed with the knowledge of Kate Blanchett's excellent acting and and you are a fan of hers I would say it's worth watching this at least once just for that she really is just phenomenal it's it's incredible how subtly she yeah now 
Let's see. Yeah, the the worst aspect is there there is too little diversity. It's not that there's zero, but like you know, there is at least one person of of color and they're basically like they're a, they're a minimum wage worker. I th I think they're like working at a a bar or something like that and they're they're barely in the movie and like you know, it's it's like the movie does have empathy for white women, which is more than can be said for a lot of Western cinema and the lower class attacked by conservatives through the policies they fight for. And you know, cinema of the two thousands was too married to the idea that the leads need to be white. So the the fact that they can't go past white women and also have more empathy for non whites you know that's that's too bad you could very very easily like you you know Annie has the the um, over the course of the movie she has maybe half a dozen different clients and I think only one of them is a person of color and that character is given almost no screen time either you know it's not that it's not that no, but that that there are only white people in the South. I've been to the South. I know. It's that white people in the South don't like people in the South to not be white, so they don't want them in movies, and they don't, you know, they they try to erase their historical achievements and contributions. And it really sucks that this movie, kind of you know, kowtows to that, that's, yeah. But overall, I, you know, I don't think it completely ruins the movie. Or anything. Now, the, the, the negative reviews basically say that, like, it's boring and they, they, they dislike certain aspects that I will argue against in the spoiler set in the second spoiler section and yeah I you know I don't think the movie's boring you know I, th I think the 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 things that it makes sense to criticize about this are the fact that it definitely like I would I would think I, th I think this would have been a much better Twilight episode than it is a feature film. If if this was trimmed down to a tight 42 minutes, you would really have something amazing on your hands. And it's not, you know, again, a simple plan. I don't want anything cut from that movie. I don't think there's a single every every line, every little detail is is just pitch perfect. Like there's nothing that detracts. Everything contributes. You know, and yeah, so so you know, it's not a Sam Raimi directing thing. It's the screenplay he was working with thing. Now, before I watched this, I was probably most worried that it would struggle with balancing drama, Raimi and Evil Dead, Raimi, and the movie does do a, a really good job. Like the the yeah. And the thing I was most looking forward to was the cast, and even though I had really, really high expectations, the movie exceeded them. I, this was the movie that got me to really keep an eye on Giovanni Ribisi. This was the first thing I saw him in, and it was like, holy crap, I gotta see this guy. You know, I think I knew everybody else the, the, of the, like, major uh, names, you know. The, uh, yeah. Now, uh, the the trailers do give at least a little bit too much away, but at least one of them does also give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like. The cover and poster do not give too much away, also don't really represent the movie, but I don't know... I, I, it's not easy to represent a movie like this in a, in a poster. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it is has a 57% 50 from critics and a 55% from the 
audience score, so for both Rotten. And of the 122 critic reviews, 70 are fresh, and the average rating is 5.90. The average audience rating is 3.4 out of 5, for those who might not know. Anything above a 3.5 is like a, what's it called? That's like an, an upvote, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah. And the consensus, with a reported budget of around 10 million, the gift is obviously a labor of love for those involved. Unfortunately, the A-list cast can't prevent the movie from becoming a by-the-numbers who done it, with an ending that's all but unsatisfactory. And, yeah, it's, it's very rare these days that I do a video on something that is not fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's simply because I, I knew, you know, I remembered loving the movie. I wanted to to watch it again and do a video on it. On Metacritic it has a 62 out of 100 based on 29 critic reviews, 16 positive, 12 mixed, 1 negative. <laughs> the negative one says so chock full of stereotypes as to be a filmic southern country safari. And the User score is 8.1 out of 10, based on 182 ratings, 148 positive, 20 mixed, 14 negative, and let's see, so the, yeah, there's one negative review, and it says terrible acting except for Blanchette, so yeah, 100, I, I agree about Blanchette, but everyone else does really great as well. Yeah, this person says Keanu gives one of his worst performances in this movie, so I don't even know. Like, we're not speaking the same language, my dude. And, right, there's two mixed reviews, and let's see, one person said the movie could have done with more time spent on its script. It ranges from dull to melodramatic. And another says that... Let's see. Yeah, this person really does not like the the ending. Huh. Um I that's okay, that's a I can't talk about that without spoilers, so I'll just copy it into my notes, but that's definitely something I want to Talk about. Oops. There we go. Now, let's see the. Um, right. On IMDb, it has a 6.7 out of 10 based on 72K votes. And 33.6% gave it 7, 24.0 gave it 6, 17.0 gave it 8, 8.7 gave it 5, 5.4 gave it 10, 5.3 gave it 9, 3.1 gave it 4, 1.3 gave it 3, 0 0.8 gave it 1, 0 0.6 gave it 2. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense the, to, to split it like that and there are 401 user reviews on IMDb or 341 if you hide spoilers and let's see the oh did I oh I forgot to there are 87 links in the IMDb external reviews section and I was able to 52 of them I was able to read, which means that's the amount that are in English and not dead links, and the movie was nominated for 11 awards, and let's see, um, I'm not seeing any wins. Um, maybe, did it not win any? 
I, yeah, I guess not. It it was nominated for eleven and won zero. And oh right, right. Clicked away too soon. Yeah, so the yeah, Kate Blanchett was nominated for Phoenix Film Critics Society Award. <clears throat> Best actress in a leading role. And it was nominated for a Saturn for Best Horror Film, Kate Blanchett, Giovanni Ribisi, Hilary Swank. And the writing duo of Billy Bob Thornton and Tom Epperson. It was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award for Ribisi. And yeah, there was also a stunt award that, yeah, the the very, very, well, I'm, I'm not going to detail it because it's a spoiler, but yeah, it's a really excellent uh, stunt award. And it was uh, nominated for a Fangoria Chainsaw Award for Kate Blanchett and Keanu Reeves, and a Teen Choice Award for Choice Horror Slash Thriller. Now, I read the 100 top voted IMDb user reviews, including spoiler ones, since I'd already watched the movie. One of them rated it a 1 out of 10, 3 gave it 2 out of 10, 6 gave it 3, 9 gave it 4, 4 gave it 5, 9 gave it 6, 25 gave it 7, 16 gave it 8, 10 gave it 9, and 11 gave it 10. So, yeah, by far the most popular of the reviews were the ones that also really loved the movie. And, right, so yeah, there's some really solid effects work. It's not an effects-heavy movie, but, yeah, what there is, is is really great. There's, like, one bit of very bad, obvious CG, and it's it's too bad, because I, I... I have to wonder if they had to, like, rest physically restrain Sam Raimi, because it's the kind of thing that, like... The Sam Raimi from, like, just ten years earlier would have done, you know, practically. And it could have been, it, it, you know, it would still have been a tad obvious for, for the time and for the specific effect, but it would have been so much better. But that's, you know, this is, like, I, it would be, it would be a shorter list if we just listed the movies from like the 90s and early 2000s that don't overindulge in CG that even at the time you know I watched when I watched this the movie was only four years old you know and it's still you know yeah I remember movies from the 2000s so the yeah I in the 2000s I watched movies I knew what made good effects and bad effects and this was always a, a bad one but yeah most of the time it is done you know yeah there's some there's some really really convincing practical and some really great stunts also which is of course good when you have a story that involves violence <clears throat> now in the description box i will put one link to a review that I recommend reading. Did I already? Huh. Oh, real quick. Yep, I already did. Excellent. That is almost everything. So, yeah. Um,. I rate this 7 ESP whodunits out of 10, and yeah, uh, I might watch this again pretty soon, maybe later today, honestly, it's a, yeah, let's see, so the, yeah, um, so the updated ranking, worst to best, all of the Sam Raimi movies that I've watched. Spider-Man 3, Oz, Dragon Hell, The Quick and the Dead, and the rest of the ones that I all love. The Gift, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, Doctor Strange 2, Evil Dead 3, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1. I'd like to think that one day he'll be able to direct some, write or direct something that will unseat 
the first Darkman movie, but I don't know if it's a very realistic expectation. I absolutely love that movie. I can I can sit down and watch it pretty much any time. Now, that is it for the review. So from here on out, there will be spoilers. And get right into the first section entitled notes taken while watching and these are going to be in chronological order think of it as a running commentary live tweeting or the like so yeah th we you know we get a very creepy opening and i really appreciate that you know she points out to the this guy I think you need a doctor. You know, it's it's, it's it's clear from right away, and this is apparently like this is based on you know Billy Bob Thornton's own mother, apparently psychic. So, you know, yeah, like some people would rather see a psychic than talk to a doctor, and for that kind of thing, it's really great for someone for the psychic to be, you know, no, you. You should talk to a doctor. She even offers, would you like me to contact the doctor for you? And she sends the kids to bed, has to clean up after them. And, and we see that, you know, Ben doesn't go to bed right away when say, you know, and I like the detail. I gotta say, I do not remember the names of the other kids. Um... Uh, let's see. So the little one is called... I know how to find out because there's a thing right here. Um, let's see. Oh, wait. Ben is the youngest. Oh, wow. Then I have no idea who the what the oldest is called. Um... Okay, I'm going to be calling him Eldest. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. So Miller is the, the middle. And when, you know, like, like basically, when, when Ben has to get from somewhere to somewhere else, a lot of the time Miller, like, picks him up and carries him. You know, this is the kind of thing that you, you know, if their father was still around, you know, that might be something he would do, but he's not. There's no, you know, there is no adult man in the house, so some of these boys have to be, have to have to split the, the man of the house work between them. You know, it, it's no nobody should have to, you know, and it, I have nothing but respect for any, you know, if you choose to be a single parent and you're actually really good at it, seriously, you, you know, I admire you, but nobody should be forced to be a single parent. And yeah, so, so, you know, the moment that they, you know, they have to go to bed, so Miller picks up Ben, and carries him in, and Ben doesn't, like, argue. The The only one who, who stays is the eldest, who, you know, and he's, like, I actually, for, I forget what he says in this scene, but I think even here, it's about the, the, the father. And you know she when she when she goes to bed she looks at the picture of him and and she cries so she is still you know upset about having lost him which you know I'm not saying that there's anything weird about that it's only been a year everyone grieves differently if you're never let anybody tell you yet that you're grieving wrong there's no such thing the you know some people do things they shouldn't while grieving. That is, of course, not good. But, yeah, there's unhealthy ways to grieve. But the, you know, yeah, she's she's basically, she's not confronting it as much yet, which, you know, at the end of the movie, you know, 
I guess bec you know the 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 fact that Buddy as a ghost helped her. You know the the this notion of you know she can she can ah, what's it called? I guess that helps her realize that even you know even though her husband is dead you know that it's important to still remember yeah I, I don't I'm not gonna claim that I think I completely understand what may you know it's good it's healthy to to confront that the person is dead and you know it's very sweet that the, the you know the whole family hug each other at the the grave at the end I'm just not entirely sure what led to it. Now, you know what what made the what made it change. And we meet Val, and she has been beaten, and you know she she expresses she's actually she feels shame over it rather than you know she the you know. She, I realize that it's it's very it's very difficult. I you know, I was abused as a child, so uh, by my mother, not my father. So the the you know, I know, but yeah, you know, logically, like you can't do something that means you deserve to be beaten, especially by you know the, the uh, what's the let's see, some people call it spousal abuse. D domestic abuse, you know, domestic abuse is never okay. Now, but but yeah, you know, the you you could see it on the on the lip, and she's got sunglasses on, and she takes them off, and like she can't even open the the eye because of the bruise. You know, really really excellent makeup work there. And yeah, we learn that that's right. Mike is the eldest. Mike got in a fight, and he's in the infirmary, and we do also later see he has a, a bruise, and yeah, you know, um, I forget his character's name, so I'm going to find it real quick. Ah, uh, there. Wayne suggests that she, you know, get Mike some, some therapy. I, I will say, like, there really were not a lot of scenes of her talking to Mike. It's mostly just he mentions the the that he misses their father, wants to visit the grave, wants to talk about it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she shuts it down, basically, is the thing. And then by the end, she's ready to, to open up to him about it. I was I was trying to figure out if I thought it was actually a bad thing about the movie, but it, no, it it just shows that that's she's trying to grieve by basically shutting down by not facing it when Mike needs to, yeah. And she gets a vision of Jessica dead, and. And, you know, I, I saw at least one person say, you know, why doesn't she say anything? And she also didn't warn her, her husband, even though she had a nightmare. And she says she can't use it for personal gain. I mean, it wouldn't be personal gain if she warned Jessica. I think the idea, and maybe the movie should do more to, to underline this, I'm not sure she's actually able to change things. I think, I, I don't think she can prevent things from happening. I know that some people, you know, when they hear psychic, that's what they think of. You know, oh, it means you can see the future before it happens and you can change it. But I don't think that's the idea with this kind of psychic. I mean, keep in the, the she sees Jessica dead before Jessica is killed. And then we find out, yeah, you know, Jessica is later murdered by Wayne because he can't handle you know the 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 fact that she cheats and I, f I feel like it's probably one of those things 
where if she did tell Wayne, if it, or, yeah, if she at that point said that she sees Jessica's death, you know, maybe it ends up destroying that relationship, but she's going to find someone else, and that person is going to kill her for cheating. I, th I think it's supposed to be one of those, you can't stop it, kinds of things. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, Buddy talks about, you know, he felt so good, he felt like he didn't even need his medication, and like, you know, I immediately think, oh, please don't, please don't, please didn't, please tell me you didn't skip, and, and he says, but I took him anyway, uh, you know, and then he says, I feel like I might be hooked on them, you know, which, that is sadly also, you know, a possibility. Um, if anyone watching this, if you're considering not taking your medication, please talk to doctor or psychiatrist or, you know, whoever is responsible for that kind of medication. And you're allowed to, you know, get a second opinion if you feel that that's, you know, but don't stop taking your medication without talking to someone who, who knows. And, you know, he talks about being suicidal. You know, basically, Annie tries to help everyone she meets, but nobody really helps her. She is alone. You know, similar to the Babadook. You know, there's a lot of... You know, I, I really appreciate stories like that. You know, these movies were made 14 years apart, but or released 14 years apart at least, you know, a lot of women in today's society feel alone, feel like nobody is helping them, and that's something we have to, you know, that can't be allowed to, to stand. We have to make sure that there's always someone that you can ask for help. I really like the way the, the filming, we don't see Donnie's entire face at first. Like, we see a little of his face. We especially can't see his eyes. You know, we hear his voice and he, you know, he says something happened to Valerie. You know, it's, it's very, very dehumanizing. It tells us how to feel about him, which actually, I really wish they took out the line with the, with the slur. But, you know, then... You know, of course, she's like, something happened to Valerie, so she lets him in, and then he says, what happened to her is she's been talking to you. And, you know, he, he threatens her, he threatens the kids, and it's actually, it's when he threatens the kids, that's when she isn't, you know, that's when she really stands up to him, you know. And... Yeah, and, and, you know, not long after, when Valerie is at Annie's, you know, Donnie grabs her and pulls her out of there. Very, very, like, just real, real punch to the gut, that scene. Really, really nicely done. And... I don't know why, but for some reason, I always, in, in both of these viewings, I grab onto the fact that they're like, they're painting, and the, you know, Donnie knocks over the paint can, and let's see, um, yeah, yeah, Valerie gets some paint on her clothes, and Annie tries to, you know, chase after, but slips in the paint and falls, and just... I, I don't know, it's just, it's that detail, you know, it would have been easier to choreograph the scene without paint, especially considering that it's a, uh, it's handheld and, and one shot kind of, like, if one little thing goes wrong, they have to do it all over, but the fact that it's there just makes it feel real in, in a way that I just, yeah. And she gets another... 
vision and they go to the the country club and it's you know she's not a member but Linda invited her or something like that you know and let's see the yeah and and Donnie broke in and what does that say I I can't tell what I wrote there um oh right right the, you you hear the heartbeat pumping as she investigates you know and we see that Donnie spelt the word Satan on the you know he's he said that she is a Satanist earlier so let's see and um, yeah, and you know she calls the cop, uh, calls the cops the day after, and they won't help. You know, one, I mean, he's a hunting buddy. Who, you know, yeah, he's a little, you know, but I don't think you would really hurt someone. Just yeah, and. Yeah, and and the um, yeah, and Donnie calls and threatens her for calling the cops. And yeah, so I wrote Ben, but I guess I was I was I think I meant Mike wants to talk about their father, and Annie shuts it down. And then we learn that Jessica is missing. And Donnie, after verbally abusing, uh, I guess Mike grabs his arm, and Buddy took a Louisville slugger to both headlights, slashed a hole in all four tires. Uh, you know the and and actually, you know Donnie grabs a gun, and uh, you know Buddy like puts it to his his forehead and shouts shoot me you know because the the trauma that he, you know he's basically got PTSD you know he's he's suicidal he he will suddenly go from yeah i'm doing okay to like way you know and yeah he ends up committing suicide and let's see and I appreciate that the movie doesn't feel the need to, like, spell out exactly. what I, I don't think any character says the words, Buddy was raped by his father, but all the pieces are there for you to piece it together yourself, you know. And it's the kind of thing, you know, you can only really examine that kind of thing with an R rating or higher and it's it happens way too much you know so it's very important to to have movies that that acknowledge you know the and and I really appreciate like the movie you know the the for for as many times as it shows Jessica's murdered body for as many times as we see Donnie strike someone it never feels the need to show the the rape that the, you know and and buddy expresses that it was it happened more than once you know so so yeah and and i really appreciate the detail that here you know the rapist like right now there's a just insane hatred against trans people a lot of really really hateful irrational people although I suppose hate is irrational so I, I don't I didn't need to say both of those words blaming trans people and the numbers just don't support that like it's a it's an yeah it's an irrational fear there's no there's no real basis for it the the numbers 
say that you're much more likely to be raped by a cis man than by a trans man or woman. So I really appreciate that in this movie, it is a cis man. And it's the father. It very, very frequently, like, people think of rape as, oh, you know, someone, like, jumps out of a bush and grabs a woman or something. That's not... Again, that's not what the numbers say. It's much more like, it's not always family, but it's very frequently someone in your personal circle. You know, and, and what we need to take from that is everyone has to be taught consent. And, you know, you, you need to, you know, it, it it's painful to say out loud, but you do need to worry about some of the people close to you. You need to think about, you know, could I imagine them actually raping someone, sexually assaulting or raping someone? Now... Right, uh, so yeah, back to the the note. So after the, the car gets, uh, you know, a great cut between, you know, we, we see the phone ring, Annie answers it, and it's Kenneth. And it cuts smoothly from the, the phone to him talking, to, to them being in person. You know, because it's not, you don't need, like, it used to be that, you know, if you go back some decades, you would have to have, either, either you hear both sides of the conversation, or the side of the conversation you hear conveys... And it's just not necessary, you know, because the next scene tells us, you know, the, the and, and, yeah, it's not the, that's not when we learn that Jessica went missing. We saw that in the, in the, let's see, first we hear it and then we see the paper that says it's been days later. But, but yeah, you know, so we already know that that's what it's going to be about. I think he maybe does say on the phone, I think you've already heard that my daughter's missing, something like that. And then we just see the, the you know, the psychic reading and the, the, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, we get another vision and the flower, you know, she grabs the flower and it wilts and she's shocked by how bad the CG is. Like, I'm telling you. Actually, yeah, I, when I when I talked about effects in the in the review itself, I was thinking, oh, I mean, I guess like you'd have to do like stop motion maybe, but actually they could probably construct a flower that would like you know, if you if you made it from the right material, it it would just, like fall apart in in her hands. It's it's such a bad. I I really wish that wasn't in the movie. It's it's it immediately pulls you out, you know. And some people really hate the the violin playing man. I I thought it was fine. I, I suppose I get why some people thought it was silly. And, you know, we see Jessica floating and the eye opens, which is always such a great, like, yeah. And... You know Donnie? Please reply. Don't transition to the next scene. And let's see. Yeah, they they find. Uh, what does that say? Um. Yeah, I can't tell what I wrote, so I'm just gonna move on. They they find Jessica. And yeah, the the you know the 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 lawyer. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can find his name. David, the the defense attorney. Wait, the prosecuting attorney. I guess is. I don't remember all the those terms. But the yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, David, the attorney who's trying to put, you know, yeah, put Donnie behind bars, you know, he asks, you know, Annie, did you have sex with Donnie? 
because you told Valerie that she should leave Donnie, and he he can't imagine that a woman would have empathy for another woman. You know, it's it's apparently not even really a secret that Donnie is abusive towards Valerie. But no, like women don't have empathy. Think these misogynist patriarchy, you know, patriarchal men. No, no, no. Women are constantly competing over men and using sex as a tool. So just, you know, she's she's suddenly on trial even though she hasn't done anything wrong because she's a woman. Now, let's see. And that brings us to yeah, you know, Buddy says that he touched himself while thinking of the Blue Diamond, and, you know, it's it's very clear, like, he needs to talk to a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you know, it's not, but, but he just, he wants to understand what's going on there. And, you know, at first the, the phone is, I, I like the, the little thing of, you know, Mom, the phone's ringing. Mom, the phone's... I heard you were going to let it go to the machine. And, you know, they have those... Yeah, the, the machine, she can hear the the thing. Uh, what's it called? You know, the, the message being left on the machine. She can hear it while it's being left. So, you know, yeah, here's that Buddy is, you know, about to, to kill his father. And, yeah. You know, we get the last little <clears throat> the the details. You know, we see the the blue diamond is a is a tattoo on like the the lower part of Buddy's father's belly. So you know, he orally raped Buddy, and you know, Buddy asks Annie, "Why didn't you help me?" And let's see, I I have no one. You're the only one I. You're the only friend I have, and yeah, apparently, like the you know the mother knew, and Buddy blames her for not doing anything when you know it is more complicated than that it's not the the same thing as just not you know she might have been afraid of him as well you know unfortunately the movie doesn't really you know try to try to get her side of, of things I, I don't mind that we don't get the the father's side there's no there's no reason to doubt that he did rape buddy now let's see you know, obviously, it's not good that Buddy burns him. You know, because it get it means Buddy gets put away. I guess it would probably be better if, yeah, the best you know the ideal scenario is that Buddy's father would actually be punished for for rape. I mean maybe there's a there's a chance because the victim is not female. So you know, when when the the rape survivor is a woman, the it's it's absurd how rare it is for for men to get punished for raping women. How many how many rape survivors aren't believed at all? Now and and you know we get the the trial, you know some great reaction shots between <clears throat> like you know we'll 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 realize Valerie told you know shared some of what you know we we the audience knew but you know is you know are they gonna tell the cops and and this you know and and at least one point Annie. Like looks at Valerie and it's like I'm I'm really relieved you you told them that he's been beating you you know this this needs to to stop and you know it 
it helps build a case against him that he's violent against even his own wife, you know, let alone other women. And then you have the, uh, what's it called? <clears throat> you have the, um, Yeah, at another time, you know, I think, uh, I actually don't remember what it was, but there was something that the, the, um, that, that Valerie had told them, and, and Annie looks at her like, oh, I wish you hadn't told them that, because that makes, you know, this, that makes me look bad, that makes this worse, and there are times where Donnie is on the stand, and he looks at Valerie like, you know, she told them that. And yeah, during the the trial, you know, the lawyer, the 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 defense attorney basically bullies and verbally abuses Annie until you know she she has the mildest of reactions, and then he's like, you know, cl clearly that was what he wanted. And he's like, no other questions, you know, the the it's it's this an insane double standard, and it's something we're seeing right now with, you know, if, if people think they have power, they feel entitled to go much further. And we're seeing, you know, there's some conservatives who are literally saying the words, we need to eradicate transgender, you know, from, from public. Yeah, I'm not going to use the, it's such an absurd, there's a, there's a term that suggests that transgender people, that it's like an ideology, and it isn't. So I'm not going to repeat that term, but yeah, saying we need to eradicate from public life, and it's, you know, and then he gets all like, what, I didn't say genocide, like, it's, yeah, the, the you know, I'm gonna, there's a, um, instead of just, Thought Slime did a really excellent video, um, yes, the case against Michael Knowles, I will link that in the description box, instead of just reiterating everything that Thought Slime said, but yeah, just briefly, you know, yeah, we have conservatives saying things like that, and then, you know, trans people just like, like there's this expectation that trans people have to be calm and collected and repeatedly, repeatedly, ex you know, ex excusing and apologizing for and and making the case for the the you know their own existence and the you know the the tiniest little thing like you'll see uh I, what is what is that channel name um uh let's see she talks about Ah, let's. I swear I'm not gonna spend forever trying to. The the. Um, ah, what's. Um. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I can't find it real. Um, um, yeah, maybe I, maybe I can't find it real quick, but there's a, there's a really excellent, uh, trans woman YouTuber who, you know, points out, like, you even when like transphobes will literally go to a rally where like trans people are just like you know nonviolently just just spreading the message and transphobes will go up and like touch them against their will and just try to provoke a reaction and then you know transphobic media will say oh look this trans person attacked someone clearly they're the you know they're the violent ones it's completely absurd now 
Uh, oh, right. I also really... The really great cut between the, you know, us seeing the blue diamond and then the, the trial itself. And, yeah, Donnie, of course, says he was framed. And we see Annie with her her cards out. She almost won a game of tic-tac-toe. And let's see. Yeah, Valerie is says that she's glad that Jessica is dead because of the the cheating. And you know, Valerie admits, I know, I know I shouldn't be thinking that. You know, she she hates Jessica more than she hates her own husband even though her husband is beating her and like Jessica you know okay she shouldn't be having sex with you know she shouldn't be cheating but like and and that's that's internalized misogyny and let's see yeah they do the the thing with the bath water running over and Jessica is in there and it looks like there might be a connection between Wayne and Annie. Wayne wants them to be together, and Annie, you know, turns it down. And you know, we and yeah, and Annie expresses, you know, she feels, she says, "I don't think Donnie was the the right one." And we see Wayne upset. And in retrospect, we realize he's not upset. Because, oh, you know, I thought he was over. I thought he was out. No, he's upset that he might be caught. And Annie confronts the defense attorney to reopen the case and says that she knows that he was, that he slept with Jessica. And, you know, instead, again, like, she literally, she just said the words, I want you to reopen the case. And then when she says that she knows that he cheated, he assumes it's for selfish purposes. That's why she's coming to me with this. And he says, do you want money? Uh, you know, he can't imagine that she actually cares about the right person being punished for Jessica's death. For Jessica's murder. And... Yeah, we get the, you know, seems like Bud, and then we get the, the shadow, and then it's Wayne, and he says, let's check together alone for, to, to, you know, if, if we can find out. And it legitimately, like, he's been so non-threatening that you really don't think, like, I, I'll fully admit, like, I, when I watch one of these, I try to guess, you know, I didn't, I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, he's got to be the one then. I honestly believe that he just wanted to know. He wanted it resolved so that they could have peace about it. Let's see. And... Um... I can't tell what that's supposed to mean. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna have one. on. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, you know, the, there's, we see several, um, oh, right, right, yeah, we, we, you know, in the vision, she sees that a flashlight was used to hit Jessica, and we see that that's the same flashlight that he has. And, you know, we get glimpses of, you know, maybe it was Valerie. Maybe it was Buddy and, and various. And then we see that it was Wayne because Jessica didn't love him. And he actually blames Jessica and says, ah, oh, she was... She, what was the word he used? She was so, uh, I, I don't think it was cruel, but it was something in, in that general direction, you know, it's just, like, 
think about how much you must hate someone to be saying that it's their own fault that you murdered them. Like, I'll grant that, you know, he wasn't, like, there's, you know, it, it seems like it, it was a, a, you know, more or less momentary lapse rather than, like, hypothetically, let's say that, let's say that the movie ends with him killing Annie, you know, I don't think that he's gonna move on to become, like, Patrick Bateman or some, you know, some kind of serial killer kind of, but, like, in even, even then, he will not admit that there's something that, that, like, I mean, I get, I suppose he's, he's willing to admit that it was wrong to kill her, but he's trying to blame her for him killing her, like, that, just how much must you do do you need to hate someone to be blaming them just yeah and buddy rescues you know and it's it's not completely clear by the end of the movie if that means that something else happened and she perceived it as that or if ghosts can actually now manipulate the real world cuz like something hit you know Wayne some some cuz it wasn't a it wasn't a situation where the yeah sorry miss wilson i'm not for real i am really just a ghost and you know he says i escaped i'm free and as we learn not long after what he's referring to is his death you know, that was the only way he could find freedom from his PTSD. And, you know, sadly, a lot of people who deal with PTSD, if they don't get really, really effective treatment, a number of them do end up committing suicide. And, yeah, we see that Mike, again, you know, was looking at pictures of his father when, you know, as, as he was falling asleep. And, you know, they, they hug as he's in bed, and it ends with them visiting the grave, and all, you know, all of them hugging each other. And that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So... Right, the, the, um, yeah, um, I think that, you know, Katie Holmes, the, the, you know, she, when, when she was on Dawson's Creek, you know, she, I, I have to admit, I have not watched very much else, you know, Dawson's Creek, this, Batman Begins, I, I don't think I've seen very much else, I haven't been avoiding it, it just, I don't know, for some reason. To, oh, right, right, uh, Disturbing Behavior. She's, she's in that as well. Um, but, but yeah, you know, she, she has this, like, she does this thing with her lip. She's, she's even doing it in the, in the IMDB. Oh, yeah, yeah, and this is actually, this is a recent picture, so she's still doing it, basically. But she, yeah, she has this, like, thing she does with her upper lip to this, this kind of coy smile. Oh, she, She's directed five things. Very cool. I think I might check out. Oh, let's see. An episode of a mini series and some. Anyway, getting distracted. Yeah, the the you know she has this coy smile that she does, and you know on Dawson's Creek, like, it's it's the the, you know like. She plays very different characters. I, I have to admit, I don't remember much of, of Dawson's Creek. But I don't think that her character in that is as, you know, the... the um, the um, Let's see... Yeah, so the... the 
Oh, right. That's I put it down here. That's why I can't find it. The the um, you know yeah she she has casual sex with multiple uh, partners on here and yeah just the the um, it it works that that she's you know she's still doing the 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 lip I don't think she does it very much in Batman Begins or at the very least it's very toned down there it really wouldn't fit the character much now when this came out a bunch of creepy guys were gleeful that Katie Holmes the girl from Dawson's Creek to many went topless and one user review says about time she'd only been acting for three years but yeah to some people it's like how long do I have to keep watching this woman before she gets naked for me and one I forget if this was a critic or a user review, but one person said, while the Katie Holmes fans have a definite reason to see this movie, they're not fans. They're just attracted to her. Fans want to see her act. And one person muses over whether it's worth sitting through the movie in order to get to that part or whether people should just fast forward. Just so unbelievably creepy. Remember back when that was the thing? Creeps would focus on nothing else about a movie than if it provides masturbation fodder. Oh, that's still 100% going on. Wow, that's sad. To be clear, there is, of course, absolutely nothing wrong with the movie using nudity. It's rated R. It's not, you know, kids can't sneak, or kids would have to sneak into it. Kids can't buy a, a ticket normally to, to watch it. And it is actually motivated by the story. The actress has said she felt it made sense. If she has regretted it since, Google did not tell me so. You know, because the, the, basically, you know, the, the, like, even right before, you know, killing her, Wayne still wants her to get naked. There's this, you know, just, yeah. And, let's see, and, and you know, it, it makes it appear, you know, it, it helps make it more credible that Donnie was the one who killed her. It makes it look like a, a rape murder case. Don't get me wrong, if you object to how women in the inter entertainment industry are pressured into sexualizing themselves and in many cases end up regretting it, obviously that is a problem. And I'm not saying that this movie somehow makes that okay. It just appears to me that this movie is not a particular case of that. You know, sadly there are many. And I saw someone say the movie doesn't resolve the conflict between Annie and Donnie. After the end of the movie, logically, Donnie would be released. He would continue going after Annie. Sadly, that is probably true, and I would say the movie should perhaps do at least a little more to address that. I don't think it's a problem for the movie itself that Annie herself, like Jessica, becomes the victim of a man's rage, just that it doesn't acknowledge it as much as it should, because it goes with the themes of women being victims of this patriarchal society. And the... Yeah, so, uh, hold on. Oh, right, I think, right. The, um, there we go. Um, yeah, so, a number of user reviews have very little respect for Jessica because she has casual sex. And I would say that the movie itself doesn't really judge her for that you know, in my opinion, women have a ca having casual sex should be viewed the exact same as men having casual sex. In other words, consent, protection are the only things that matter in any kind of judgment of it. Don't try to police other people's sex lives as long as consent is respected. And no, she shouldn't be cheating. Cheating is a consent violation, but many men cheat. Historically, more men than women, though more recently the numbers are evening out because, you know, it's the... the let's see, I read that it was... You know, to to an extent, men had more chance to to cheat, and now women are also. You know, it's a it's a problem, but it's not unique to any particular gender. And men are often expected to be forgiven, where women aren't. Now, I saw one person say the ending is stupidly convenient and deeply sexist. I think. I, I'm the 
the thing I, the, the only thing I can think of that that user review must be referring to is the, the um, what's it called? Uh, the, f the fact that Jessica says that she doesn't love the, um, she doesn't love Wayne at all. She's with him because, what did she say? My father, you know, yeah, to, to, because her father wants her to be with him, or some, something like that. And, you know, she says she doesn't want to marry him anymore. He's too controlling. He's, um, what was it? Um, because he's, like, spying on her, and she, she gives back the wedding ring, or th throws her, something like that. I mean, I don't think that the movie is saying that... I mean, again, some people just don't feel love for their their partner, and I, I don't know. I don't really judge Jessica for it. She just, it seems like she's in this, she's in a, a, a situation that is not... Did I not copy? I could have sworn I copied in. Um, uh, okay, um, let's see. I know where the... What on earth? There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, real, real quick. Another critic said, Katie Holmes makes a convincing ingenue, rebellious and tired of the small town Brixton pace. Thank you. Exactly. The casual sex is caused by that, not, like some misogynists claim, some inherent to women lack of loyalty to their male partners. And another critic said, she surprised me with strong cast as spoiled baby-faced debutante. And like the rest of the cast, she's playing against type and excelling at it. And, you know, the... the go. You know, the... the I mean, essentially, the, the... You know, Jessica feels like everybody else gets to make decisions for her. She's the partner she has is because her father forces her to you know like I realize that you know having a female character outright say I don't love you to a man you know that is a misogynist trope but the fact that I don't know, I guess I just felt like the 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 movie should have spent more time on Jessica. I think that's where the the problem is. I suppose as it is, yeah, I, I yeah, I see what he means about it being sexist. Now let's see the The, the, right, so, yeah, um, some critic quotes. This person gave it a 3 out of 10 and said the, let's see, yeah, he, he thinks that the following are, are loose ends. Is, that's, that's the, yeah, so, yeah, he says, you know, Annie doesn't fails to contact the authorities after twice being assaulted by Keanu Reeves, once with a multitude of witnesses. When she finally does call the police, she fails to bring up the attacks in support of her charges of breaking and entering. And in fact, during the entire trial of Barksdale, the issue never arises. But the... I mean, I, I got the sense that when she talked to the cop, like, the fact that... You know, she, she tells him, I think Donnie broke in, 
And he just says, I don't think that's, no, I know him. I like him. I don't think, you know, I believe that's the reason why. And, you know, yeah, she doesn't bring it up during the trial because he said that he was going to kill her and her kids if she talked to the cops again. I, I really don't see it as, as like, yeah. Let's see, and... Yeah, and then he says, yeah, he's the one who says that, the, you know, now that you know, Donnie is going to be released, he isn't going to be too happy with Blanchette. And then he says, now without her protector, Ribisi, but, I mean... That depends on how you read the, you know, if, if you choose to read the ending as Ribisi can be her protector, you know, he can, he can physically knock out people, then that's, you know, that's the answer to that. One person says the trial was poorly filmed. I mean, it focused on their, their faces and used good used reaction shots to good effect. Again, I I wish this person made more like came you know provided some examples, provided some arguments for that claim instead of just the claim. And then they say made a mockery of how the trial should be run. Everything about it seemed unbelievable. There was one scene where Annie is ridiculously attacked by the defense lawyer Jeter on a personal basis while the district attorney doesn't even object. I believe that the movie is intentionally making the point that the trial is not fair, that women perceived not to be good Christians in the South rarely get justice, and this is backed up by the facts. I suspect the reason that a number of user reviews say that they found the court scenes frustrating because of the injustice on display, and for sure there's injustice on display, is because of all the propaganda that asserts, which we now know is not true, that the American court system really does punish the guilty and release people who are innocent without demanding they pay through the teeth through for, you know, it's absolutely true that the scene has people obsessing over the psychic ability of Annie, but this is because that makes them uncomfortable, perhaps more uncomfortable than, know than knowing that there's a killer. Because killers just have to be caught and executed, just like the Bible says. But the Bible is very hostile towards non-Christians who have any sort of power or ability. And let's not matter, let's not pretend that the Bible is not the primary book guiding the actions of the trial. Clearly, it is not the book of laws, or the book of Vishanti for that matter. Let's see, and another critics, and another user who said, I think part of why I was frustrated with this movie originally is because Annie is a seemingly weak character. She easily breaks down on the stand, barely does anything to defend herself from Donnie while somewhat chiding Valerie for not leaving him, and spends most of her time trying to hide from the world. I still find her frustratingly so, but it now makes her a bit more human. When Donnie comes violently into her home and the police refuse to do anything about it because most of them are hunting buddies with him, it kind of underscores why Valerie can't. Valerie can't just up and leave. It seems that Annie thinks that because she is psychic, that she has some sort of control over the world around her, and time and again she's reminded that she does not, and that makes her more isolated and frightened. This wasn't the only review to be frustrated with that aspect, but not everyone realized why. Here in the West, we're taught that confidence is always better than a lack of it, which leads to a lot of awful people expressing confidence about their ideas. Moves like this can help people realize how important it is to respect people who lack confidence, and we see that at least some of the people who do have confidence in the movies are causing harm. One of the most... Even even without, like, if confidence wasn't treated as a virtue in and of itself, rather than confidence when you're doing good, there would still be people expressing awful views, but we wouldn't have so many people rallying around those people. So, you know, I, I would say some of the... You know, some of the people I think are the most reprehensible are the ones expressing with confidence awful ideas that, you know, just a little bit of research and you can tell that that idea doesn't hold up. And, you know, ideas based on hatred of, you know, minorities and, and such. Now, another user review, one... Right, so this is the, yeah, the, the one-line summary is, pick your horse, Raimi. 
And the review says, here are two or three great movies wrapped around each other in one rather mediocre one. I assume the script is initially at fault, but a director of Raimi's caliber should know how to pick a direction and stick with it to the end. Instead, he chooses to focus equal attention on too many characters, too many plot lines, and all in rather short time. And let's see. So, we care about the murdered girl. We care... Oh, oh no! So, wow, he says we care least about the mur. Wow, okay. Uh, we care nearly as little about her convicted murder, even less about her actual murder. We don't care about the investigation. We don't care about the trial. We don't care about the supposed love triangle. I don't. The love triangle involving Jessica, maybe I don't know. Yeah, he points out we care, we do care about Annie, Buddy. Let's see. There is a considerable depth to Buddy's tragic story that, along with Blanchett's psychic Annie, easily warrants a two-hour picture. Let's see. Uh, instead, it is left as a subplot, albeit the most interesting one. The second most interesting subplot, Annie versus Donnie versus Valerie. And yeah, for the first 45 minutes, the gift seems to be Annie versus Donnie versus Valerie. And yeah, the husband finds out, starts harassing the psychic with increasing intensity. On it could have gone into a potentially great thriller in the vein of Cape Fear or Fatal Attraction. That is true. This could easily have been... Yeah, and that that is too bad. Let's see. Yeah, and the third great film gone to waste is what The Gift thinks it is in its second 45 minutes. Part murder investigation, part courtroom thriller. And... Let's see... The psychic angle gives it an original twist, especially the dilemma of a woman might end up finding herself in if she lead if she led detectives leads detectives to a body on the property of the man who threatened her children without an inch of tangible evidence. In a better film, she might find herself the suspect of the murder and of framing her enemy. And the gift she doesn't, although she is somewhat ridiculed by the defense attorney. Yeah, that that would have been no, it's yeah, there's definitely let's see. And Raimi splits his focus and attention towards several different but equally capable horses when he should have spent all his efforts and talent on one. That would have given him a winner, instead he ends up with three losers. Four if you count the audience. Let's see. Billy Ray Joe Bob Thornton is a man of the South, but he seems to have sold himself to the Hollywood establishment. Or maybe he's writing what he saw. And let's see, yeah, he has co-written a story about a southern town where men beat their wives, fathers molest their sons, their sons then burn them with gasoline, sheriffs would pay more attention to their supplies of donuts than a murder investigation. The obligatory cop donut gag, which, I mean, we know today that is literally, it's just true. This is all stuff that actually happens, and if it doesn't get called out, it always will. And, you know, yeah, I, I addressed this earlier in the video, and let's see. Billy Bob portrays the South in a similarly loathing way as most Hollywood writer-directors. What gives? I mean, I feel like when someone that does or did belong to your own environment portrays you in a negative way that resembles the way that you're frequently portrayed by, you know, people who aren't a member of your environment, you know, 
I'm not saying, you know, oh, where there's no sm smoke, there's no fire. It's not always going to be the case, but it doesn't really seem like this person even considered that maybe, you know, Billy Bob Thornton saw something he did not think was good in the South and decided to leverage the, the Hollywood, you know, yeah, make, you know, put it in a movie to, to actually... Yeah, get get into how bad these things are, and yeah, you know there are a lot of wife beaters and a lot of sexual abuse in the South, and because they insist that it isn't happening, it doesn't get better, you know. But you know this this very review, you know this Southern person instead of saying these things shouldn't happen and here's how we stop it, he's just upset that it's being talked about, you know, that's why it's happening, that's, yeah, and, and then he goes on to say, ironic how the decadent Hollywood finds so much bone to pick with the moral fiber of the American South, I mean, there are Hollywood movies that criticize the decadence of Hollywood, um, you could go with a classic like Day of the Locust, I hear good things about Babylon, I haven't watched it, I might at some point, like, it's not, it's, yeah, and yeah, the the um, let's see the the yeah the the person then goes on to say that, you know, the movie Billy Bob and his new Hollywood friends feel superior to these semi-skeptical locals. In the meantime, every other Hollywood moron visits a psychic, thinks that's so new age and hip, not to mention intellectually sound. There definitely is, like, like I mentioned earlier, you should, if, if you believe in anything, you shouldn't be criticizing others for it being believed. But I don't think the movie is saying that, I mean, First off, the movie really doesn't, like, Donnie brings up, you know, he says that it's, she's not, that Annie is not a good Christian for being psychic, but a lot of the time they don't really, like, if the movie was trying to be critical of Christianity, then the lawyer would be saying, you know, the this this the the you know when he's mocking her psychic ability he doesn't say this is not like real psyche the, you know this is not like what's in the bible so, you know that's what you would do if you were trying to say that oh look at these christians for hating psychics the the you know basically I'll grant that it's perhaps not the most, it's maybe not the best metaphor, it's arguably not used the most <sighs> subtly and effectively, but basically her psychic ability is a metaphor for her femininity. She has it, her grandmother had it. Men don't, you know, think highly of it, and they don't, you know, it's not a great metaphor, because at the end of the day, like, psychic ability, you know, essentially, you can't, you know, you it, it can't pass a scientific test the way that scientific principles can. You know, it's it's not reliable in the real world. And, you know, the movie would probably be better if it wasn't about, like, psychic, if it was just, you know, if, if they chose something that, like, you know, yeah, some something that's, that's, that women, that, that is considered feminine and not masculine, and, you know, she, yeah, she's, she's able to, realize, you know, 
yeah, you know, the the way that there's there's some of that in legally blonde, you know, you could you could do something like that. But as it is, however clumsy it might be, the yeah, the the psychic ability is a metaphor for her being a woman, so when she says to someone because of my psychic power I know this, you know, the the real life equivalent would be her saying I know that you know th this is true, and men not believing her because she's a woman, you know that's what it's actually about. But I, you know, for sure, like Hollywood people thinking that psychics are credible, but I really don't think that's what's going on with with this movie. There's there's way more American movies made that you know promote Christianity than ones that promote psychics so if Hollywood was so you know infested with people who believe in psychics why aren't there way more movies about it like you know and, and very frequently like you have a lot of movies that say that Christianity is the right way to live and people who don't live the Christian way end up miserable a lot of movies about psychics are not about psychic power making your life better so it's not really like I don't think this guy uses the term propaganda, but you know that is he's leaning in that direction. That's just not what the movie is. Yeah. And then he says that the char the actors don't look southern. Blanchette, an English woman, plays a poor southern psychic. What idiot cast her? I love how southern people suddenly understand what it means to have people cast as what they actually are the moment that it's literally white southerners. Whenever it's an actual minority, they will scream to high heaven about how it doesn't matter. And let's see. <clears> hmm. <throat> Right, and, and one person says, WTF are the cards she's using? You can't read fortunes with shapes and squiggles, XD. You can't read fortunes, period. But I will say, it is, I don't know if someone was, like, trolling, or they just did zero research or what, but yeah, according to the IMDb goofs, factual errors. The cards which Annie uses have nothing to do with fortune telling or prediction. They're they're called Zener cards, are a deck of 25 cards, five of each symbol. They're used to test for ESP and see how closely a su subject is able to predict their order in the deck or which one is hidden in an envelope. They're not made to use ESP. They're used to test for it, and that's yeah um, yeah. And and another the the Zener Ryan testing cards are not fortune telling cards the, they test psychic ability between test subjects to include remote viewing not as another form of tarot cards for example you know Donnie also holds up something that he says is a a voodoo doll but then doesn't you know it's it doesn't look like anyway and and there's also someone hilariously I, I hope this was added a really long time ago because someone added as a plot hole that it doesn't make sense that like they say that you know the the father died a year ago at the same time and the grave marker said he died in November which you know it wasn't November and earlier in the film it was April that's not a plot hole, it's just a... yeah, whatever. I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. And, right, apparently, like... Psychics have been used in investigations for decades, have been taken seriously for decades. That's so sad. The simple guy who keeps bothering her, so annoying. I think it's supposed to be. I don't think it's supposed to be fun that he keeps. And, and then the person does go on to say, we have to see dead women's breasts multiple times. Disgusting. Have to sexualize even dead people. That is really, really gross. It's just, and, and there's just not, like, 
I already mentioned, I don't think it's a problem that she was topless in the, the scene where she dies, but you don't have to, like, you know, I'll, I'll grant that sometimes it seems kind of ridiculous, but, like, if, you know, I've watched a bunch of NCIS, you know, and they'll have, you know, if, if you, yeah, when you, when you, like, investigate a dead body to find, like, the cause of death, like, you're not actually worrying about, oof, I don't want to, you know, let's, let's make sure they keep the underwear on, no, you just, you, you know, that's, that doesn't, you know, and NCIS isn't, you know, the, the, I forget what the rating is, but it's not high enough that you could show nudity, so they just, you know, they strategically cover, or the light in, they light the, the body in such a way that you just can't make out that, that area, and yeah, they could, they could have done something like that here. The dim-witted behavior doesn't stop with her. When I tell my daughter to stay outside, that's what I mean. Why do her kids always seem to show up when she told them to stay away? The movie is showing that she's under pressure from even her kids. It is a movie about a woman who is under pressure from even the people closest to her. It is not, in fact, a documentary about raising children for, who understand boundaries. Let's see. And, and then, you know, the, the user reader goes on to say, I hate when writers try to drop that in for suspense. Points for not pretending like this is the only movie that does it. And then they say, isn't it bad enough she found the cards on her on the bed? Wouldn't have made a difference if the kids saw. Of course it would have. Children are very, like, the, the, um, if, if a child feels threatened in real life, that's going to really mess with them. It, it messes with adults as well, but children especially, it, what an absurd, like, are you saying that you don't think they can read because they heard, you know, they they all heard him say that she was a Satanist, you know, he wrote the word Satan across the like. I'll grant that maybe Ben can't read yet, but I'm certain the other two would be able to, you know, and it's a it's this really God fearing town, so of course they know that word. They they, yeah, I don't. Anyway. That's it for the video, so let me know what is your favorite, you know, movie about people who see dead people, uh, you know, to, to start you off. There's, of course, there's this, you've got the I movies, you've got the site, which I'm certain one person out there, other than myself, remembers exists. The, the failed TV pilot that Paul W. Anderson was responsible for when his career was in the toilet. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, let, let me know. And, you know, do you think that there should be a sequel to this? Do you, th do you still hope, hold out hope for The Gift 2? And it's just like Annie going around reading fortunes, and Buddy is like her her bodyguard, and you know every so often he'll have a PTSD flashback. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. I've done vlogs on uh, yes, I've done vlogs on some other entries in this director's filmography. It, you know pretty much all that I've watched. There's a link to the playlist in the description box. There should be a link to my main channel page, one to more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about my spoiler -filled thoughts on the most recently available to me episode of True Lies, the show, and the episode of Scream Queens that I've gotten to. Recently, the Review and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.